about respecting to well. Okay, so let's go. Uh, so first of all, thank you very much to you, Jon, and for all the SER organization to allow me to, to invite me for this presentation. Um, first of all, also, I'd like to apologize for my English, for those that, well, you will see that, I mean, I, 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 I try to speak as clearly as possible, but this is not my mother tongue. And sometimes I know that it's difficult to understand me. So please, at the end of the seminar, whatever thing that is not clear enough, just ask again. Uh, well, <clears throat> The, the, the talk of today is about yes, this precision restoration or in, in, in another sense, how to restore a forest. In general, how to do restoration ecology, okay? But we will focus in this work in forest. Um, obviously, to restore a forest depends on what is the objective. Um, I am assuming that the, the objective of the restoration that we are talking about today is to restore the native community, the native forest. If we are talking about the plantation or whatever, obviously this may happen too, but it's something different, okay? Um, forest restoration is, today we use restoration, also we could use reforestation, but well, Many reforestation today could be a perfect restoration, but it's not necessarily like that. But anyway, uh, probably I will use restoration and reforestation in the same sense. A good reforestation could be a good restoration, although restoration can be something different than reforestation. However, very often what happens is that we have we are translating, not I mean when I say we in society, practitioners, etc., we are translating very often the practice of restoration, of reforestation to restoration. And this is this two picture, for example. This is a re, re, well, reforestation, and you see many, many trees, high density, uh, even spaces and so on. The, I don't know what is that, okay? I mean, this is from the web, but this is a mangrove restoration in China. And it's the same thing. This is obviously for conservation. We are not going to get any uh, economic impact mediate um, uh, product from the mangrove is mostly restoration and we are doing the same. And this is very common all around the world. I have to say, finally, as I've, I've first also some preliminaries that um, I am very much habituated to work in Mediterranean type ecosystems, um, dry lazy, dry areas, dry lands, ecosystems. So please be aware that obviously uh, there are ecosystems very diverse where some of the things, or many of the things that I will say do not apply, okay? But we can discuss that later. Okay, so let's go to the real theme. So this is a potential way to restore the forest, but how else could we restore the forest? We could do something like that, and this is the very common theme. We could go a step further, um, create a more diverse forest with higher diversity. These two options could be perfectly good, but we have also another option. Look at that. What we are doing here is just to plant less trees, much less trees in particular places where they might create an environment to foster interactions, ecological interactions, seed dispersal, wind dispersal, or whatever. And so in this way, there is at least an ecological advantage, only from the point of view of ecological um topics okay that is here this is this is not yet a forest we need more trees but it has the structure of the forest the, it has uh, with time we will have um demography gaps dense stands and so on this is more the function of a real forest but apart of that there is another potential advantage and another potential advantage is that one if we plant less trees, it might be that we can save money from that to take care of the plants in the future, all right? So this is the key point here. If we do not take, take care of the plants as we usually do, there are very little restoration programs that take care of the seeds or the seedlings in the long term, no more than two, three years, even less, even one single year. So it may happen very easily that environmental factors, climatic factors, abiotic factors may ring the restoration. And in the end, finally, we might get just a few trees and this is no success. So uh, we do think that we have to be very careful about the success and the efficiency of the restoration because, oh, sorry, because to have a forest is not to sit seeds or to plant trees, to have a forest, to have a forest in the future, all right? In the future, maybe 15 years, 20 years, five years. This depends, obviously, 
in the, on the system. In tropical ecosystem, they grow the trees much faster, okay? In the dry land, it's much slower. But we need to guarantee that we will have a forest in the future. Just as an, an example, here in this area, this is Sierra Nevada National Park here in South Spain. Uh, uh, well, we were monitoring reforestation uh, 12 years ago. There is virtually nothing now. There is less than 5% of the trees were planted. And the only care was to plant the trees, nothing else, okay? The saplings, two years old saplings. Look at this here. This is some 15 years old. This slope with the tree shelters. Can you see that here? And well, we can see just two trees, two trees after all this time. We will come back to this, this picture later, but just as an example that we need to increase the restoration success. Um, well, it might be extreme cases of of failure. Um, we are now witnessing a very rapid increase in the news, in the companies, in the initiatives, for example, to restore the forest by drone seeding. Drone seeding might be a very good technology, a wonderful solution. Of course, it could be. All right, but look, all these, for example, these are news from newspapers of different parts of the, of the world, Spain, UK, Mexico, Canada, Australia, Madagascar, all the news in the newspaper, and even the companies that do that, they are reporting that they are planting, or planting, they are really seed, seeding, all right, thousands and thousands of uh, seeds, plants, hectares, but never report success because probably success is very, very small. But the point is that mm -hmm, we are very much habituated to see technology as something very positive. We have a guy here digging a hole and planting a, a seedling. Compared to that, this guy is a troglodyte. We tend to think that, and we tend to think that this will be successful. So we have a very high risk, to, in my opinion, that we um, sell something that is not real, that we are going to restore forests, planting trees or sowing seeds, but we need to ensure that this will be a forest in the future. And whatever the methodology that we use, very classical or very high tech, we have to be aware that after seeding or planting, there are many environmental factors that will reduce the success of this reforestation. And when the seeds or the seedling became saplings or juveniles, they will still be subjected to hazards, to herbivory, to frost, to radiation, etc. Um, well, I, I, I have, John, probably you here, I, I guess you are there. Um, somebody left a hand, okay? So I, I keep, mm, is, I don't know if someone needs to say something, some report something. We, um, you, can, you can continue, Jorge. We okay, generally okay. ask that people ask their questions through the Q&A and then we do it all at the end. All right, thank you very much, John. Okay, uh -huh. so the, to me, the good news and the problem, okay? The good news is that forest restoration uh, is something, I mean, there is a big uh, concern today about forest restoration, and we have a big momentum to restore forest. However, forest restoration is not about to, to drop trillion of seeds or from the air or to plant billion of trees. And we have now big commitments to do that, which is good, okay? But look, we have to take care of the forest for the future. We have to try to ensure that we will have a forest in a few years. And somehow, you have here that the message that restoration ends with the seeding of the seeds or planting of the trees is speculating in the public and in the policy makers. Policy makers. And there is also a growing business about restoration uh, because, well, there is money to restore because there are, uh, there are initiatives and there are, for example, a market with carbon credits to, to plant trees. So this is putting more pressure to get a fast result, okay? So... We, I think, I will discuss that at the end of the presentation. I think we have a high risk of a big failure if we do not take care of what are we doing. So what should we do from our point of view? I mean, when I say, or I mean the people that already my co-authors or the one that wrote the paper, uh, well, we think that we should create a functional forest ecosystem, okay? Um, 
If for that we can plan a huge amount of trees, perfect. But if not, maybe we can create a functional ecosystem with a less amount of trees. But especially, we have to take care of these trees. We have to create an, a system that works alone. And for that, we can use any technology, very, very classical or very, very high tech. Okay. And we should increase the success of the reforestation. And if we increase the success and reduce the cost, this is increased efficiency. Because we usually do not pay attention to the efficiency efficiency of in the restoration works okay this is more and more said now but usually we in the classical restoration or reforestation is just to do the work and forget it for the rest of your life and if we are lucky we will have a forest if not well we will do it in some years later and we should change this mind so in this context we wrote this this review paper and basically we propose that we should be more precise in restoration. We propose the concept of precision restoration. This is not exactly, for example, precision agriculture, or precision, far precision farming. This concept in precision farming is mostly devoted to the use of high technology. Here we think that we can use any technology. We can combine any technology, method, and um, ecological knowledge to try to guarantee that what we plant today or what we seed today will become an adult tree in the future, in the future, maybe five, 10, 15 years, <coughs> sorry, years. And so we have to include many different things and we can do that. Um, to illustrate that, I'm going faster, okay, to have time for the questions, I will use two examples. So we will stop a little bit in these two examples and then we can span the concept to other potential uh, issues that you raise. Well, look, a very important issue in restoration, for reforestation or restoration is herbivore by large mammals. We know from decades ago, uh, many studies are obviously observation that we can plant the trees that, but later if there is higher herbivore pressure, and in many parts of the world that's a higher herbivore pressure, either by domestic livestock or wild livestock, then the trees even cannot reach maturity. Look, this is a maple. This maple in Sierra Nevada National Park is 30 years old and will never produce an adult tree. This is a holm oak, an oak of 15 years old, is completely reverberized. This pine that you see here, this pine is 22 years old. 22, believe it or not. I know because we plant it, okay? So it's 20 years old. It's not only the one like in this situation. All the restoration in this area very basically is like that. The, there is a higher beaver domestic livestock in this area, and the trees cannot cannot regenerate, right? Or this is a mangrove in well that it has been eaten by water buffalo um, in Asia. So um, herbivory must be taken into account for, for that. Look at these pictures. These are oaks in the ESA in Southwest Spain, where some of them were protected by a wire mesh here. Can you see here this, this device, okay? And those that are not protected and are of the same age cannot grow. They are mostly dry uh, because of continuous browsing. So we can observe some nature-based solutions and natural solutions. We know very well from ecological theory and studies that whenever there is a barrier, a big barrier of a, a spiny shrub or a non-palatable shrub that, pro, that block the access of the herbivore, then we have recruitment of very palatable trees. Some other examples, the Spanish wrap that are allowing the growing of a sorbus area or a maple or an olive, wild olive tree protected by a dwarf palm. This is, for example, a very common situation in South Spain, north of Africa, Morocco, Tunisia, where there is a very high river pressure. And we know very well the function of that. This has been studied for decades from an ecological point of view. And this is within the context of associational defense or associational refuges. That means that if we have a very palatable plant, well, livestock, we love with this plant. But if this plant is protected by a non-palatable plant, either because it's toxic, because it creates a good barrier, or because it's spiny, then the herbivory suffered by this plant can be reduced. 
but we know very well and for example, look, look, there are very little studies studying that from the point of view of restoration. We know very well from the ecological theoretical point of view, but not from the restoration point of view. But this, for example, a very interesting study that um, analyzed this from the point of view of restoration. Um, one of the main conclusions of this study is, yes, plants can protect other plants. But look, in the end, in most of the cases, the beaver will eat the target plant, the plant that we try to restore. Why? Because herbivores has all the time for them, okay? All the time of the world of the world. They can browse, you know. I mean, they, they are just trampling, passing from one place to another. Uh, in the end, they will find the plant and eat it. So look, this was just six, seven years ago, but we did a study some 21 years ago. Um, we went, we had reached the same conclusion. The herbivore, look, this is the this is a U that is growing very well, completely protected because it's surrounded by Spanish wraps. They must be almost completely protected. The herbivore cannot reach the plant. So this is the angle of contact, okay? 301, 301 from 360. I mean, this is almost surrounded. When the plants are almost surrounded by Spanish wraps, they can recruit like we can see in this picture. As you may see, these pictures are clearly from the last century, isn't it? <laughs> so these, these squares. Okay, so the point is that we know that from long, a long time ago, and this is not new. Could you imagine who described that very well a few more years ago, which is amazing, guys, please go to, us, go to this. Go to the origin of a species, chapter five, Darwin was describing here that in the heathlands of UK, the Scott pine couldn't recruit because as soon as the sapling grew above the height of the heathlands, they were brought by the wild and domestic animals, all right? So it's amazing. That is 160 years ago. That is in the origin of a species, and we still do not pay enough attention to the impact of herbivory in the uh, restoration, in the reforestation. So it is clear that we should do something. Uh, of course, we can use heavy machinery for doing many things, but why not to imitate what is nature doing? So if we have a juniper that protects the maple, why not to plant a maple, an oak, or whatever tree within the juniper? We can go there because this is feasible, okay? We can walk inside that and do this, this uh, plantation. So this will be a way to guarantee the possibility of uh, recruitment. Um, well, this is another option. This is a bunch of, of people of, I mean, they are friends of mine. Um, they, they are doing a wonderful work. Look, this, there is here a deciduous tree that is very palatable, very edible. They plant the tree here and then they take these materials, iron wire, these and scissors, and they bend the branches and create a barrier a go, a, around this tree like that. So they estimate, they do actually, that they can plant two people, uh, one tree every 20 minutes. Well, this means 15, 20 trees per day. Well, is that cost efficient? Well, I don't know, it depends. Because if with that, we can create a landscape like this will be cost efficient. If we don't know, do, not this, do this, this procedure and we plant many, many trees without taking care about them, about the herbivory, and we finally get nothing, so this won't be cost efficient. So cost efficiency is something that we have to take in consideration in this medium long term to create the forest. Um, well, I don't know if we can, uh, there is a video here. Hmm. Well, sorry, well, we are late, but I will show you, I like to show, yeah. Why not? Hmm. The Zoom doesn't allow me to present the video, sorry. Okay, but there is a video where the person is doing that, say at the end, like the Maasai, yes, because finally he's putting branches around, okay? And so I was just prepared that picture to say a Maasai village, how they really used 
uh, death, dry branches to protect them, to protect the, the cattle. <laughs> Uh, also, no, I mean, uh, for lions, okay? So this is a very effective barrier. I mean, it's just that we have solution that we are not using very often. So there are other approaches. Look, if we know that this can protect from herbivory in the future, we could drop seeds, okay? We could also protect the seeds against predator by different ways, okay? There are different substances. So, okay, so we can do that by hand. But look, let's go to the drones. We could do that also by seeding from above with a drone. All right, so we can combine different approaches and this is a very good technology for that. So the point, as I said previously, so far aerial seeding with drones is just firing seeds all around the landscape. My suggestion is that we might do that, but with a much higher precision. Um, so how to do that? Okay, we can have a very precise high resolution map with the GIS system of plants. We could use the coordinates from remote sensing to pass, transfer these coordinates to the drone and see the seeds inside these, these wraps, for example, these micro habitats that are good for sowing. But we can have more options. We could use artificial intelligence. And look, we are doing a big jump, okay? From manual seeding to artificial intelligence. I don't know anything about artificial intelligence, but there is very much many guys in the world that do that, all right? And they can create the deep learning models that if you train that very well, in the end, you can automate the processes. So in this way, we can scale the processes at a very large spatial scale. And in that moment, at the beginning, it's slow because we have, we have to create the model. But once the model is created, we can work very fastly. So the system can select later which are the species that we want. And we can then again transfer the coordinates to the drone and do a real sewing much more precise. And this is not fiction, okay? This is something that already is happening. Because, for example, these guys uh, in particular, well, this is one of the person that is in the uh, one of the authors of the paper that I uh, mentioned about precision restoration. They are working in the identification of plants with deep learning. In that case, this is food, these shrubs that grows in close to the sea, all right? So the, this is possible. We can do that. Still, we have to refine many things, but it's something that is potentially useful and that could be a different approach for restoration. So, so far, I am finishing my first example. What we have is that we can use those wraps either as nurse plants or for protection against herbivores. And let's go to the second example. Let me check time, please. Yeah. What about using bar, of course, woody debris as biological legacies for restoration? This is a barn tree, a pine that felt and is protecting from herbivores and also probably from also is providing uh, better microclimatic conditions for the growth of this juniper. Um, dead wood is a wonderful biological legacy for many reasons. In the case of barn, the wood could be dead for other reasons, okay? But fires, um, wildfires is a very common disturbance all over the world. And so the wood, when, they, when it decomposes, improves the physical and the chemical properties of the soil, provide organic matter, uh, increase nutrient content, improves microbial activity, increase soil moisture because it reduces a little bit, uh, like in this picture, for example, reduce wind speeds, reduce radiation, all that improve the water content, reduce the water strength of the city, and etc. Well, this is a study that we did a few years ago. Um, well, this is um, the isotopic composition in 13 carbon, of pine seedlings regenerating in an area where we did nothing after the fire or where we fell the trees but left all the wood there or where we remove, I mean, the local forest service removed the, the barn wood. This is what is called salvage logging, okay? That they eliminate all the wooded debris. And you can see how if we have branches, we have trees, the water stress of the seedling is smaller. And well, there is more to say about that. The seed, the, the seedling, well, sapling, because they are this height, they grew better, they accumulate more nutrients, they reproduce faster, etc. So in summary, 
barnwood is a natural uh, element, is a biological legacy that we consider for restoration. Um, this comes from something that is very well known also in ecological theory, that is facilitation. Facilitation is a positive association between two or more plants where one plant benefit the other plant that is recruiting below it. We know very well from theoretical uh, ecological theory that this is the net balance of positive and negative effects. And usually there is a negative effect through ground, underground, because of nutrient com competition for nutrients. But there is a much higher benefit above ground because of reduction of a little bit reduction of extreme radiation, uh, reduction of extreme te low temperature, reduction of wind speed, increasing air relative humidity, increasing water content in the ground, in the soil, and so on. So in the end, these higher positive effects counteract those one, and we have facilitative effect. And this happens very commonly in semi-arid ecosystem, Mediterranean ecosystem, ecosystem with a dry period, but also look at that here, for example, semi-arid and tropical ecosystems also, okay? This is a meta-analysis that was done in 2009 by Lorena Gomez Aparicio. We have advanced a lot since then, and always we confirm the same thing, that facilitation is quite widespread all around the world, and that in general, we have this effect. So, summary, what can branches, death branches, um, burn branches provide for us? Well, it's like an umbrella, it's that. If we go to this situation, this is death material. So there is no competition, resource competition at root level. This only provides benefit through the composition of organic matter, through reduction of radiation and so on. So why not to use this for restoration? However, Salvage logging is something done everywhere in the world. The forest service usually, or the companies, timber companies, they remove the trunks. And well, that's fine. If there is a benefit for that and they have to explore it, could be, okay. But then they chop the branches. They, they chop completely the branches with these kind of devices and leave that completely desolated like that. It's not always like that, okay? But this is very common. And this is everywhere. These are different maps. I mean, mostly Northern Hemisphere for a meta-analysis, but this is another study. The red dots is post-fire solver logging. We have also uh, a storm, post-storm or after insect outbreaks, but mostly, you see mostly uh, uh, cases of post-fire salvage logging. I mean, this is something that happened in all the continents and the forest services, local forest services do massively, okay? But we might have another options. Imagine that even we need to remove the trunks. Okay, we can remove the trunks, but we might leave the branches behind and we might do pile of branches. Actually, there are more and more papers saying the benefits of having pile of branches because birds go there, um, disperse seeds, because there is nutrient decomposition, because there is more better condition at ground level, at soil level, etc. And then we could plant seedlings or we could drop seeds from a drone, all right? I mean, I finishing with the presentation is basically to say that there are other options, that there are many, many um, possibilities to approach the restoration and that we might be much more efficient, precise. Um, this, in our opinion, might reduce considerably the cost because we could focus and we have to focus in the particular citrus. Obviously, many citrus will die, of course. And obviously we cannot take, take care of the citrus as a farmer take care of their potatoes. That's obvious. Even it's not necessary because trees that we plant to, for the restoration of the forest are wild trees that are very much adapted to the conditions, okay? It's not like potato, like wheat or barley. But what we, there is no sense, is planting thousands, millions of trees and do not pay more attention to them. Let's go back to this picture. What was the problem here? What was wrong here? Many things were wrong when people did this reforestation, when the Forest Service did the reforestation. Probably was wrong the site selection, okay? At landscape scale, the, the soil here, these are dolomites. I mean, pff, this species of pine can grow here, but the oak that they plant here doesn't grow here at all. Cannot support this kind of soil. 
size selection also a meso scale. Probably even the pine can support this hill. Probably you have to go to slopes with low, a lower steep or something like that. Okay, so we have to select much better the micro environment, even the micro habitat, and we can do this today with many many possibilities, for example, remote sensing, we can have maps of productivity, not, I mean, habitat suitability, we can map this very well today. But then, there is no consideration here to ecological processes, but how we should focus just to plant a few trees and leave that the rest, nature do the rest of the work. And also there is no post planting care at all, okay? So, the point is that if to know if we can be today precise enough to do these kind of things. And yes, we can be precise enough. We have the technology to do this and the knowledge to do this. So as a final message, um, I think it's important to consider that under the current context, the political momentum and social momentum to restore the forest, the, the, the United Nations declaration of the decade for ecosystem restoration and so on, we have a wonderful opportunity to restore the forest. And this is a priority today more than ever, all right? But to restore the forest is to get the forest in the future. It's not just to plant these plants and forget them. And in many circumstances, it might be better to plant less trees or to seed less seeds, but to take care of them to guarantee that they can be trees in the future. And maybe we can balance the money, okay? We can save money to be sure that this will be trees in the future. So efficiency and success must be considered completely in the restoration programs more and more. Um, we have the knowledge, ecological knowledge and the traditional and cutting nest technologies to do that. So I really think that we are in a wonderful moment to, to do that. And we honestly think that we cannot fail this time. I mean, if we, are, with all the resources that are being put today for forest restoration. If we do not get healthy forests in the future, who will trust us in the future, okay? So we have to pay very much, very careful attention to this from my point of view. Okay, that's all, thank you very much. I hope we have time for question. Great, thank you so much, Jorge, for a really, really exciting presentation. Um, some really exciting methodology being developed, um, very cool to see. Um, we will open it up to a Q&A. Um, so please everyone, now is the time to ask your questions through Zoom's Q&A functionality. Um, Jorge, one of our attendees asked about the balance between competition and facilitation. And I think this was in regards to the shrub barriers, um, the example you provided. When the shrubs um, are formed into a barrier and you potentially plant a seed or seedling uh, behind that barrier, um, mm -hmm. the, the shrubs are facilitating that plant. As the plant grows, um, are there any issues with competition between the shrub barrier and the growing plant? Um, or is yes. this... Yeah, yeah, I understand. Yeah, well, um, fortunately, there is a huge amount of information now about the um, uh, the partners. Okay, which plants work better together and which not. All right, there is a lot of literature about that. Um, yeah, actually, if we go to this picture, for example, um, the key point is that the plant that is used is quite different in the root system and so on to the nurse plant, all right? So basically shrubs are good because, I mean, the trees have a deeper root system and they reduce the interference. Uh, I mean, these are, these are assembly rules in short, okay, in ecology. Um, well, the thing that we have to consider that, first of all, it might be that if we plant this tree here or put seeds, it might be even that they, they might have a reduced uh, initial um, um, success compared to other places. But the important point is that if in other places, in the bare ground, they will be completely eaten in the long term, this will be more successful, okay? And secondly, 
what will happen in the future if the tree grows and finally, uh, finally will kill the, the shrub, all right? But well, this is in a process of succession, basically. I mean, one plant benefit the, the, the grow of others. Um, well, the, the dynamic will, or the forest will create, I mean, places where no, another shrubs could grow. Um, finally, we will have a certain uh, forest succession. I want to show you that. Look, this is a salvia. That is a very good nurse plant because it's a very shallow root plant with provide a lot of benefit. This is an oak. This is a horn oak growing below the shrub, all right? The point is that this shrub doesn't protect against the herbivores because it's too small. This is another very good facilitative plant. It's a broom, retama. It's a retama. And here we have, again, an oak. The problem of this plant is that, well, it, 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 it doesn't create a very dense barrier against herbivores, but it's very good from the point of view of nutrient in the soil because it's a legume that, that fix nitrogen. Um, the, also, the, the branches are not very dense, so the, it leaves it, the path of enough radiation. So uh, talking, coming back to assembly rules, there are many pairs that have, has been very well described in some systems of plants that facilitate the recruitment of others. But we have to watch also the protection from herbivory. This is why usually more dense plants with more spiny plants are better for herbivores. Although spiny shrubs usually are not so good as benefactors, okay? But we have to see the net effect. Basically, I don't know. I hope I answered the question. Yes, I, I think that was excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, let's move on to another question. Um, some of our attendees are wondering if you have seen these types of precision approaches uh, developed, tested, or applied to other ecosystems um, or countries outside of Spain. Well, the thing is that I don't think that we are using too much this precision approach. <laughs> this is basically a, a suggestion that we should do that, okay? The paper is a radio paper where, where, where we propose that we should that. We should do that. Obviously, I mean, here we are doing uh, restoration using new plants and so on, but um, no, I, I, I think that we are not using that too much at all, okay? As a uh, so um, let's say common practice. I know that some people, for example, these guys that I show you, my friend Pepe, what is, let's see, he's called Pepe Jose. These guys, okay, they are doing that and they are getting amazing results. But these are, I mean, they, they are neighbors of a village, okay? They, they plant what they can plant. They plant maybe 100 trees uh, in, a, in a few years, but they have, almost, almost 100% of success. Amazing. And they, they protect against herbivores and so on, and they, it's amazing. They, they really grow what they, they plant. Um, well, it, they take a lot of care of the, seed, of the seedling, of the saplings. Probably in a real situation, this cannot be done in, with this care, okay? But we have to approach a little bit that. So, in, Answering that, I don't think that restoration programs are using this precision restoration approach so firmly yet. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, you may have talked about this a bit in your presentation, but are there any additional amendments to these precision restoration sites? So say for example, a site that is um, surrounded by a shrub barrier. Um, do you advocate for, you know, additional amendments such as mulching or, um, you know, soil amendments or just different things that are frequently done in, you know, your traditional restoration project to kind of increase the odds of uh, yeah. establishment of plantings? Yeah, you mean soil amendments, amendments in general, but soils or more thing? What do you mean exactly? Uh, uh, soil, watering, just really anything yeah, other. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, different. of course, of course. I mean, well, I'm summarizing here a lot, okay? Actually, yeah, in the in the paper, we, we put a table with uh, many, many 
possibility to, that we can use technologies. Of course, if we plant a tree, we can include mycorrhizas, fertilizers, uh, water retention gels, whatever thing, of course, to increase the possibility that this tree grow properly. Yes, sure. I mean, I'm simplifying a lot, okay, the message. The main message basically is that we have to take care of the seedlings a bit as much as we can, all right? And yes, we can use amendments. And there are a battery of possibilities to increase water retention in the soil. Uh, there are possib several possibilities mm -hmm. or nutrients and so on, yes. Excellent, thank you. I'm just going through the questions here. Jorge, did you want to try to share that video? Yes, yes, I can. Okay. I was thinking of that, but actually, let's see. Let's um, just give that a try. Just a second. I'm putting the original presentation of the PDF. Yeah, okay. Well, can you see the screen? Well, actually, let's see, I'm going to reproduce. Uh... Oh my gosh, wait a second, please. I don't see, okay, no. Okay, ready? Can you see that? Yes, we can see the slides. I, we don't see a video. Oh, no? there we go. Yes, yes, perfect. Okay, he's finishing now, okay? Oh, he say, like the Maasai in Spanish. <laughs> he say, like the Maasai, okay, done, let's go to something different. All right, like that. Okay, we, I have more videos, okay, showing the whole processes, but well, I know very good recording. This was on my, with my mobile phone. And this is. Okay, great. Well, I will just uh, continue asking questions. We have a lot of questions here. Um, sorry, everyone, if we don't uh, make it to all of them. So I guess, Jorge, what do you see as the kind of next steps for actually integrating this type of approach into practice? How can the average practitioner take your lessons and start to yes, use them. Yes. You know, there's a very important issue. I understand me, I, I, I know many practitioners and managers uh, that are doing that, um, especially managers that really work for forest services. Very often they are tied completely. They, their hands are tied because an important issue is governance and politi politics, I mean, governance, how to do that. Very often they have funding to do a restoration in one year and they do not have funding for anymore. And actually this funding must be spent in that particular year. They cannot save 25% or 50% or whatever for the future. And this is something that should be changed completely as a first step, okay? We have to consider that to restore a forest need time. And so the, the, the use of the budgets and so on, the, the planning of the budgets should be different, completely different. There are other programs where they really take care of the, I mean, they, they have a longer time span, okay? But very often this is not the case. I mean, there are, there are reviews now, actually in, in Restoration Ecology, there is something published about the, the uh, time that uh, restoration programs are monitored. Um, in general, it's nothing, almost one or two years, very rarely it's more. So first of all, to change the uh, governance of, I mean, how, I don't know how to call that. Uh, actually, um, John, if you have any suggestion, you, uh, if you want to introduce any English words, please go ahead, okay? It's just the management of the funding. Also, something very important, I think is um, uh, environmental education. Okay, we have to teach people, uh, the citizens, that to restore a forest is not to plant, plant, that we are very habituated to that. Um, to restore a forest is not necessarily that. We are, I mean, people is demanding this. And I know very well from, from my landscape when there is a, 
disturbance. So people quickly want to see, sorry, what is that? As soon as possible, everything planted again, okay? We have to teach them that this situation, this is a real good step for a for us in the future. And then we have to wait. I mean, once the system is functioning, once the system is providing ecosystem services, um, providing the, 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 the interactions between organisms, this is a wonderful landscape. We do not have to go to this situation again. And for that, we need some time, okay? And especially we need also to save, I mean, to be sure that the trees will be trees in the future. Um, Another issue, and finally, I finish with that, uh, this explanation. Coming back again to governance. I'm very worried now about carbon credits, green belts in the cities and so on. Well, uh, organizations, local governments, citizens, somehow we all, we are pressure, pressing a lot to have fast response. Okay, and even sometimes we are destroying ecosystem to plant trees. Ecosystem where already are trees, but we want more densified uh, landscape of, uh, with trees. So I think there is a huge amount of work about uh, how, I mean, environmental education. And well, I could add something else. Managers, very often managers, they are hesitant to do new things, different things. I know that very well from managers which I interact with then, okay? Why is that? Imagine that you, I mean, you do a restoration like that, a reforestation. Uh, you do that today and you see five years later that it didn't succeed. But you did that in the way that is meant to do, the traditional way where everybody knows, I mean, there is, a, let's say, some standards of working, all right? So if you fail, you were following the protocol, so you are safe. But if you do a new thing, you innovate, and you risk for an innovation, obviously things can fail, of course. I mean, this is nature, okay? Environmental condition may change continuously, may be very, might be very hard next year, um, you might not succeed. So if you innovate, it seems that when managers innovate and they do not succeed, well, they suffer consequences, really. I mean, they, everybody point them, all right? So I think that we, or managers, we should be, I mean, uh, brave, okay, and have courage to do, okay, to do new things and to assume risks that, well, we might, um, we might uh, have, I mean, su success or failures, but we have to try to do something um, the best as possible. Great, thank you, Jorge. Um, it looks like we have time for maybe just one or two more questions. Um, from Daniel, uh, Daniel here was asking about site preparation and specifically site preparation around these kind of nuclei or the, these precision restoration targets. I know in, you know, in many restoration sites, um, pretty substantial invasive species management needs to be done to um, yeah. control, you know, for example, cheatgrass or other ruderals that have gotten out of control. So um, have, have you thought about that or is that, is that something that comes into play with these precision approaches is um, kind of preparation um, of the areas around these shrub barriers or nurse structures? Yeah, I don't know if I can give an answer to that. Obviously, each particular site has site-specific issues to consider, all right? So if the point is the elimination of the invasive species, well, honestly, I, I don't know what to say in particular. I mean, it depends on the species and, well, to eliminate chikras is a nightmare, I know. Um, but in general, about site preparation, first of all, I think it's very important the site selection, and we can do a very good site selection according to the best environmental conditions, okay? We can use uh, remote sensing and these systems to know very well for very precise landscape, I mean, at the scale of meters, 
even centimeters, okay, but it's good to work even at the scale of meters. How, what is radiation intensity, uh, hydrological processes, and things like that. This could be selected according to that. We can see not only the landscape, but also taking going back to the to the primary production maps, for example, we, they, we, we may identify very well where are the places that are more productive, the less productive, and so on, okay? So even, for example, talking about chikras, perhaps with remote sensing, we can have a map that help us to decide something. Um, in general, point here is also that the precision restoration approach, in my opinion, we should try to reduce the impact of the restoration. Okay, so if we need heavy machinery, okay, we should, we should use, but try to reduce as much as possible the, the use of heavy machinery. So site preparation, I suggest to that should be as reduced as possible just for the scale of the plant. Okay, but well, any, obviously I insist, uh, any specific place has different problems and I cannot really answer this question uh, in general, sorry. That's, yeah, that's completely understandable. Thank you, Jorge. And it looks like, unfortunately, that brings us to the end of the hour here. Um, I'm very sorry to all of you who asked questions that didn't get addressed. Um, really appreciate your present, your participation. Uh, thank, thank you, you to, oh, go ahead, John, please, let, let me say something. If I, I will be very interested to receive feedback of people if they want to contact me by email. Sorry, I think I didn't write my email. Um, wow, would you mind? Well, how can we, there, there is, I guess, uh, yeah, 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 well, is the chat. I can, so Jorge, we send out an email to all our participants okay. with certificates Perfect. of participants participation so i'll just add it there and invite them to all right all right and i will love very much to receive information about for example how is the restoration success in the places where everyone lives okay and they are, everyone knows because this is not a i mean this problem is more acute in some places of the planet than in others so i will know very i would like very much to know how this problem of of restoration success is in each particular place. So I really appreciate if I receive some information and I try to answer as fast as possible any question written by mail. Okay. Thank you. Excellent. Thank, thank you, much. Jorge. And uh, thank you uh, to everyone who was able to attend today's webinar. You'll be getting a follow up email with a certificate of completion as well as a survey to give us feedback on today's event. I also encourage you to visit the SER website to see a list of our upcoming webinars, as well as to learn more about our work and the benefits of membership. A recording of today's webinar will be made available later today in SER's webinar library, which is at ser.org slash webinar library. And to all of our certified restoration practitioners who are in attendance today, this webinar is pre-approved for one continuing education credit. Thanks again to Dr. Castro for an excellent presentation and hope you all have a nice rest of your day. Okay, bye, John. Bye-bye. Thank you.